Good morning, everyone. You're very welcome to our worship service. I pray we'll all know God's presence as we worship him together, and we'll listen to him as he speaks to us through his word. One or two announcements to begin with. Uh, first of all, there'll be a creche for preschool children uh, in the Valley Room at the same time as Sunday School from today onwards. And this is to help the, the Sunday School children and teachers focus on what's being taught from God's Word. Then there'll be a short meeting at the front of the church immediately after this service for anyone who'd be willing to help with a Christmas tree festival in December. Uh, I'm breaking my own rules. I don't like talking about Christmas before December, but we need to to think about this well in advance. Uh, This is a great opportunity for our congregation to reach out into the community with the gospel uh, at a time of the year when people are open uh, to to listening uh, to that gospel, and also the opportunity to raise funds for the work of Christian organizations in the process. So to make this happen, we need your help. So I hope that lots of you will wait behind uh, so that we can arrange a a fuller meeting to discuss all that's involved in putting on a Christmas tree festival in December. Our first membership class is this afternoon at 4 p.m. in the committee room. Uh, If you're not a communicant member of our congregation, but you're able to honestly answer those questions that appear on our announcement sheet week in, week out, then please come along. And if you have any questions, speak to me, and please let me know if you're hoping to come this afternoon so we have materials there for you. Then our devotion group uh, for all young people in years 8 to 14 meets tonight at 7 p.m. in the youth room. Uh, Parents, please prioritize bringing your young people along to devotion so that they're blessed by the program uh, that's provided for them there. Then the Connect Bible Study for Women meets on Tuesday at 8.15 p.m. in the committee room. Now, please note that the day and the time is different than normal. Uh, This month's Bible study is about putting Jesus first and serving him alone. So ladies, please prioritize coming to Connect so that you're blessed by the Bible study and fellowship that is there. And then the Equipped Bible Study for Men meets on Wednesday at 8.15 p.m. in the the committee room. And again, men, please prioritize coming along uh, so that you're blessed by the Bible study, so that you're blessed by the fellowship at Equip. And if you don't have a copy of the Bible study, there's some on top of the organ and piano. Uh, Pick one up uh, and take it home and have a wee look at the questions. Then all ladies are encouraged to attend the PW Link Rally in Banside Presbyterian Church on Thursday at 7.45 p.m. Uh, The speaker will be a representative from Reach Mentoring, which is one of the organizations being supported by the PW Mission Fund this year. Our congregational prayer meeting is next Sunday at 10.30 a.m. in the committee room, so please come along just a little bit earlier next Sunday uh, so that you can join with us in prayer. And the guest speaker at our worship service next Sunday at 11 a.m. will be Mr. Alan Cousins, who represents the work of SAT7. Uh, SAT7 is the other organization being supported by the PW Mission Fund this year, and ladies of her congregation will be taking part uh, in our service next Sunday. The loose offering next Sunday will go to the work of PW. God calls us to worship him with these words from Psalm 118. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will extol you. We'll see later in our service that the crowds in Jerusalem used the first sentence on the screen to praise God when Jesus entered Jerusalem on the Sunday before his crucifixion. Psalm 118 is a a royal coronation psalm, but notice where the coronation procession leads to. It leads to the altar, which is a place of sacrifice, and that was certainly true for Jesus. However, the place of sacrifice wasn't in the temple in Jerusalem. For Jesus, it was the cross outside Jerusalem. The way to Jesus' ultimate coronation at the right hand of the Father 
was via the cross, where the king was sacrificed so that his people could surround his throne forever. And we're going to join to thank and extol God using the words of our opening hymn. All glory, praise, and honor to you, Redeemer King, to whom the lips of children made sweet hosannas ring. As we come to God now in prayer, we're going to begin by adoring his perfect character. Then we'll confess our unfaithfulness to him and his ways. And finally, we'll thank God for assuring us that he forgives us when we truly hit our sin and turn from it. So let's come before God with our prayer of adoration, 
confession and thanksgiving. Almighty God, as we worship you today, help us to do so with hearts that are open to your word and which are willing to apply it to our lives. We acknowledge this only because of what Jesus has done, that we can become your children and approach you in prayer as our loving Father. You are the only living and true God, yet you are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are the same in substance and equal in power and glory. We recognize that you are the perfectly holy God, who the creatures and saints in heaven constantly praise with the words, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Thank you for the privilege we have of joining with the saints and creatures in heaven to worship you today. God of grace, we praise you for the perfect life and sacrifice of Jesus. We're so grateful that great David's greater son relied on your strength to ride into Jerusalem in lowly triumph, knowing full well what lay before him. We bless you that he paid in full the price of redemption for his people when he died on the cross. Thank you for raising Jesus back to life and exalting him to the highest place to show that his sacrifice was acceptable to you. Seated at your right hand, Jesus waits for the moment when you command him to return. Enable us all to be prepared for Jesus' return by trusting in him alone to save us from our sin. Sovereign Lord, we praise you for the work of the Holy Spirit in convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come. We ask that he would deal with each one of us today as he sees our individual need. We bless you for being a merciful God, because we have disobeyed you in thought, word, and deed. Today, we particularly seek your forgiveness for the times we rejected your right to rule over us by choosing to do what is sinful. Forgive us for the times we were not concerned about those who are currently rejecting the salvation you have provided in Christ. Forgive us for the times we hindered people from worshiping you instead of encouraging them to worship you. Forgive us for the times we just went through the motions of worship rather than worshiping you sincerely and wholeheartedly. You warn us that the wages of our sin is eternal death. So thank you for assuring us that we are justified by your grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom you put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. We praise you that your steadfast love for us never fails, even though we fail you often. We bless you for your constant presence with us to encourage, strengthen, and guide us. In Jesus' glorious name we pray. Amen. We affirm what we believe by thinking about another question from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. The twelfth question asks, what did God's providence specifically do for man whom he created? And the answer given is that after the creation, God made a covenant with man to give him life if he perfectly obeyed. God told him not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or he would die. Covenant is another one of those words that isn't used very much today. It basically means a binding agreement. It's a bit like a contract, but it's more noble than a contract. People make contracts when they aren't sure if they can trust each other. But covenants are made because those involved want to express their commitment to each other. Perhaps marriage is the the most well-known example of a covenant today. Sadly, Adam and Eve broke the covenant God made with them by eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that brought death into the world just as God warned it would. The rest of the Bible explains what God did to rescue his people from their sin and its awful consequences. 
And subsequent questions from the catechism will explain what God has done. So I'll read the question, and you join with the, me in the answer, please. What did God's providence specifically do for man whom he created? After the creation, God made a covenant with man to give him life if he perfectly obeyed. God told him not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, or he would die. Boys and girls, if you come to the front, I'll come and speak to you. Okay, great to see you. A few weeks ago, we started thinking about um, this messy family tree in Genesis. Remind me, what's a family tree? What does it show you? Yep. Yep, sure. Uh, your entire family and how you're all connected to each other. And we saw God reminding Jacob that he would keep his promise to him and that he would be with Jacob. Uh, but we didn't notice that this, this family tree that started off with Adam and Eve became very messy. Before Adam and Eve, sorry, before Abraham and Sarah had Isaac, who was the son that God had promised to them, they took matters into their own hand because they, they doubted God's promise. And that resulted in Abraham having a son with Sarah's maid, Hagar, which is something he shouldn't have done. And if that wasn't messy enough, then Isaac's son, Jacob, stole the birthright and the blessing from his older brother, Esau. But things got even messier. Jacob married beautiful-eyed Rachel, whom he loved very much, but he also married her sister, weak-eyed Leah, because he was tricked by their father, Laban. And the mess just continued. God blessed Leah with many children, but Rachel was sad because she had no children. So she gave her maid to Jacob as a wife so that he could have children with the maid on Rachel's behalf. He shouldn't have done that. and Rachel shouldn't have done that. That made Leah jealous, so she also gave her maid to Jacob. She shouldn't have done that. Jacob shouldn't have accepted it. Like Abraham and Sarah, Jacob, Rachel, and Leah took matters into their own hands because they didn't trust God to keep his promises. Jacob had 10 boys and a girl with Leah and the two maids, but he still didn't have any children with Rachel. Finally, Rachel got pregnant twice. She had two boys, Joseph and Benjamin. Rachel and Jacob were so happy when Joseph was born. But Joseph, but sorry, but Jacob was sad when, after Benjamin was born because Rachel died shortly after Benjamin was born. This messy family tree shows us that the Bible is God's word. You see, if the Bible had been written by people, they wouldn't have mentioned all that mess in the people God had chosen to be his people. And this messy family tree also shows us that God is able to work through our mess and despite our mess to bring about good. And our story today is one of the messiest, but one of the best stories in the Bible. So we'll watch it together and then I'll speak to you a wee bit about it. Chapter 12, Joseph's Mean Brothers and What God Meant to Do. Genesis 37 and 50. We've heard a lot about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but did you know that the longest story in Genesis and one of the longest stories in the Bible is actually about Jacob's son, Joseph. When Joseph was a teenager, Jacob made him a special robe. It wasn't a choir robe, there weren't many choirs yet, and it wasn't a bath robe, they didn't take many baths either. It was a robe of many colors. Jacob gave it to Joseph because Joseph was his most favorite son, which quickly made Joseph the least favorite brother. And to make matters worse, Joseph had a dream that one day his mom and dad and brothers 
would all bow down to him. Some dream, the brothers thought, more like a nightmare. So they ripped apart the fancy robe, threw Joseph in a pit, and sold him into slavery. Later, when Jacob asked his sons where Joseph was, the big brothers showed their father the robe and told a lie about Joseph being devoured by a wild animal. Everything in Joseph's life was about to get worse. But then, better, then worse, then better, then worse, over and over, until everything finally got better at the end. First, Joseph served as a slave for an important Egyptian official named Potiphar. That's worse. But Joseph was so good at what he did, and the Lord was blessing him so much, that Potiphar put Joseph in charge of his entire house. That's better. But then Potiphar's wife tried to kiss Joseph. And because he knew better than to kiss another man's wife, she lied about the whole thing and got Joseph thrown in prison. That's worse. But God was with Joseph and gave him the ability to interpret dreams for two other prisoners. One of the men promised to remember Joseph when he was back serving Pharaoh. Better. But the man forgot Joseph. Worse. But later he remembered. Better. By the time he was 30 years old, Joseph was working for Pharaoh himself and on his way to being the second most powerful person in Egypt. Much better. Years later, Joseph's brothers came to Egypt desperately looking for food, and Joseph was the only person who had any food to give. Sure enough, Joseph's family was bowing down before him, except they didn't know it was him, not right away. And once they found out it was Joseph, their long-lost brother, the I thought you were dead son, they were afraid. Surely. He would not be nice to them after they'd been so mean. But that's not how Joseph saw things. You meant evil against me, he said. But God meant it for good. That's how God works. Not just for Joseph, for all his people. No matter how many pits or prisons we end up in, God is up to something better much better. There was lots of messy, evil things in Joseph's story. But we have seen that God works all things according to his perfect plan. Even through our messes, God works for his good to bring about his promised rescued plan. And yes, Joseph's story was really messy, but there's an even messier story in the Bible. Hundreds of years after Joseph, the religious and political leaders rejected God's Son, whom God the Father had sent into the world to save us. They beat Jesus and mocked him. They nailed him to a cross to die. We thought about that on Good Friday a couple of weeks ago. What a mess. It looked like Satan had won. But then remember two weeks ago, we celebrated how Jesus rose from the dead. He conquered sin. He crushed Satan. God's purpose for that awful mess was to bring about salvation. So that's the greatest story of all, because it has produced a great salvation. Thank you so much for coming up, for listening so well. We're going to say your little prayer on the screen. If you want to just go back to your seats, we'll say it all together, and then we'll sing your little chorus. So let's say the prayer all together. Thank you, God, for working all things according to your perfect plan. Help us to trust you. Amen. And our little chorus says, God is still on the throne and he will remember his own. God's in control of everything that's happening, working out his perfect purposes. 
and we need to remember that in the mess in our own lives, in the mess in our own country, and in the mess of this world. Please lift your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 19, and we're going to begin reading at verse 28 and read to the end of the chapter. If you're following the Pew Bibles, you'll find this on page 1054. I know that we celebrated Easter two weeks ago, but I want to complete our study of Luke's gospel by going through Luke's detailed record of the first Easter over these next few weeks, God willing. Today's passage is Luke's account of the first Palm Sunday. So Luke chapter 19, begin to read verse 28. As we read this, we remember it's the living word of the living God. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Tell him, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead of him went and found it, just as he told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down, the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, Jesus replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Then he entered the temple area and began driving out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests 
The teachers of the law and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him, yet they could not find any way to do it, because all the people hung on his words. Amen. And we know that the grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Boys and girls, if you want to leave for Sunday school, now is the time to do so. In our prayers of intercession, we're going to pray for Gary and Mary Reed, who serve God in Kenya through the Presbyterian Church, but who are currently at home at the moment. We're also going to pray for the congregation of Donabate, which is just north of Dublin. So let's come before God's throne of grace with our prayers of intercession. Loving Heavenly Father, we pray that you will heal Gary and Mary Reed from the illnesses which are currently afflicting them, so they're well enough to return to Kenya in May, if this is according to your sovereign will. Lead and guide Mary and Gary in all things. We praise you that they can rejoice because they have known your presence with them. And they can thank you for the thorns as well as the roses, because they know that you do all things in love and for the good of your people. Please ensure that the evangelists and worship leaders who conduct the Sunday services in Alkanye and Siana each week are open to the Holy Spirit's direction. Speak through them as they teach and as they lead worship to draw people to saving faith in Jesus and to deepen the faith of those you have saved by your grace. God of grace, thank you for enabling Chuba and Alona Veres to form new friendships and build relationships in Hungary with the team families, and individuals. We bless you for the women's group and ask that those who come along to it will continue to be built up in your words so that they can serve you in their community. We also give thanks for the three Ukrainian families who have been attending Donabate congregation for the past few months. Help the congregation to learn from them and to care for them in their difficult circumstances. Grant your wisdom to the Reverend Andy Carl and the Kirk Session in both of these respects. Almighty God, we pray that those in our congregation who are your people through faith in Jesus will be righteous and run to the safety of your name. Also grant us opportunities to minister to those who are still outside your kingdom so that the love of Christ is displayed to them and you're glorified. We ask that you'd grant good health and strength to those members of our church family who are currently ill in any way if this is your will. Help them and their families to cast their cares upon you because they realize you care for them. Guide the medical professionals who are responsible for their care. Help families who are caring for children or adults who have a physical or a learning disability. We praise you that we can be sure you know all about the demands and challenges that brings to a home. Thank you for special schools, adult centers, training units, and supported employment schemes, which are provided by government bodies and learning disability charities. Bless teachers, learning support assistants, support staff, care workers, and everyone else involved in the provision of these kind of services. Sovereign Lord, we pray that you'd provide our country with a sufficiently long period of dry weather to enable our farming community and others to get the work done that's necessary to prepare for this year's harvest. We praise you that your word is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So when we turn to study it in a few moments, we ask you to open our ears to hear it, open our minds to understand it, and open our hearts to believe it. In Jesus' glorious name we pray. Amen. We praise God again with another hymn that focuses in on Palm Sunday. Ride on, ride on in majesty. Hark all the tribes, Hosanna cry.
in May last year, many of us were mesmerized by the pomp and ceremony that surrounded King Charles' coronation in the capital of our nation. However, some people protested against the coronation rather than celebrate it. Today, we'll see God's appointed king arriving in the capital city of his people. While many people celebrated this, there were some who protested against it. Since we returned to our study of Luke's gospel last June, we have been traveling with Jesus to Jerusalem, where he knew he would be betrayed, arrested, tried, abused, crucified, and rise again from the dead. This journey took Jesus almost as long as it's taken us to study it, nine months. And he timed it perfectly so that he arrived in Jerusalem for the Passover. En route, Jesus ministered in at least 35 locations. At the end of Luke chapter 18, we saw that the blind beggar who was sitting by the roadside outside Jericho saw that Jesus is the son of David and repeatedly confessed this before the crowds which surrounded Jesus. Before and after healing this man, Jesus referred to himself by the name son of man, thereby claiming to be the transcendent being that Daniel had seen in the vision God had given him. All of this heightened the expectation that Jesus was the long-promised Messiah who would reestablish the earthly reign of David's dynasty. However, Jesus' disciples couldn't comprehend a Messiah who would suffer and die. Jesus knew that those who had been listening to the conversation he had with Zacchaeus after he entered Jericho also had misconceptions about the Messiah. They were hoping for a, a military Messiah who would bring about the defeat of their Roman oppressors and establish God's kingdom immediately. These expectations were probably growing as Jesus approached Jerusalem because it was the political and the religious capital, capital of the nation. So Jesus went on to tell the parable of the miners, which we looked at five weeks ago, to show that God's kingdom wouldn't be fully seen until he returns. That parable is a picture of Jesus' life, which speaks of his incarnation, what he invests in his followers, his rejection by his enemies, his crowning as king, and his return to judge the world. Jesus' listeners wouldn't have understood all that when they first heard it. But when they looked back, they'd have seen that Jesus was talking about his kingship and what his being king meant for his followers and for the world. So please open your Bible at Luke chapter 19 so that you can see what happened next. Jesus informs us in verse 28 that after Jesus had told the parable of the miners, he left Jericho and he set out on the last leg of his journey to Jerusalem. This was the Sunday before Jesus was crucified. According to verses 29 to 31, as Jesus approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. The location of Bethany on the eastern slopes of the Mount of Olives has been well established. It was about two miles from Jerusalem. Although the location of Bethphage hasn't been identified for certain, it was probably further along the road from Bethany and therefore closer to Jerusalem. The Mount of Olives is often referred to in the description of the final days that are contained in the Old Testament. And we'll see Luke mention the Mount of Olives several times in the following chapters. That Jesus knew his two disciples would find a colt tied up 
at the entrance of the village he sent them to is either an example of his omniscience, his all-knowing, or else he had prearranged this with the colt's owner. The fact that the colt had never been ridden implies a kind of purity which set it apart for the sacred task it was about to be used for. Jesus needed a colt to fulfill the prophecy Zechariah made 500 years earlier about the arrival of the ultimate king. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteousness, righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Before and during David's reign, donkeys were considered to be a royal animal. So riding a colt was a kingly act which identified Jesus with the royal line of King David. Jesus' actions also fulfilled an even earlier prophecy made by Jacob about the tribe of Judah back in Genesis chapter 49. By entering Jerusalem riding on a donkey, Jesus was publicly proclaiming himself to be the Messiah from the tribe of Judah and from David's dynasty, who was promised all through the Old Testament. However, when Jesus mounted the colt and rode into Jerusalem, he demonstrated that he is a servant who is gentle and meek, as well as a king who is royal and ruling. This is the first time that Jesus is recorded as referring to himself as the Lord. Jesus is the sovereign one who controlled his own destiny even as he entered Jerusalem to suffer and die. In verses 32 to 34, we see that Jesus' disciples found the colt just as Jesus had told them. And when its owners asked why they were untying it, they replied with the phrase that Jesus had given them, which resulted in them being allowed to take it. All of this demonstrates that indeed Jesus is Lord. According to verses 35 and 36, when the disciples had brought the colt to Jesus, they threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. And as Jesus went along on the colt, people spread their coat cloaks on the road. In those days, people spread their cloaks on the road to welcome a king. By entering Jerusalem on a colt, Jesus openly declared that he is the king Zechariah spoke of. And by spreading their cloaks on the ground, the crowd acknowledged Jesus to be their king and indicated their willingness for Jesus to have everything they possessed. What we have described in these verses is a patriotic celebration. The closest thing that we can compare it to in our culture is the king visiting a city. Nowadays, instead of cloaks being spread on the road, the red carpet is rolled out for the king to walk on. Luke tells us in verse 37 that when Jesus came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. As Jesus began to descend the Mount of Olives with its spectacular view of the Temple Mount on the other side of the Kidron Valley, all of Jesus' followers joyfully praised God for the miracles they had seen Jesus perform, including those he had performed as they had journeyed with him to Jerusalem. It was right for these people to rejoice at the arrival of God's King who would bring salvation. But as we continue our study in Luke's Gospel, we'll see that most of them didn't understand the real reason why Jesus was entering Jerusalem. Verse 38 contains the people's words of praise. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. The first phrase is taken from Psalm 118, that royal psalm that prays for God to bless the coming messianic kingdom that we opened our service with. 
The substitution of the word king in this verse underlines that this event is a royal coronation. The verse that the crowd used to praise God was chanted as pilgrims arrived in Jerusalem for the annual Passover festival, which was just beginning. So it was so appropriate. The feast of Passover recalled how God had rescued his people, the Israelites, from slavery in Egypt. The pilgrims who had come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover were now anticipating being rescued from their Roman oppressors through the Messiah who was riding into Jerusalem before their very eyes. Jesus had indeed come in the name of the Lord to defeat his enemies. But it wasn't Rome that Jesus had come to defeat. It was Satan, sin and death that Jesus had come to defeat. And Jesus would do this by being rejected, suffering, dying, and being raised back to life again, just like he had told his disciples several times. What the crowd expected the Messiah to do as they were celebrating his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and what the Messiah himself knew he must do, was very different. Jesus tolerated the people's brief celebration of the fulfillment of what the prophet Zechariah said would happen, even though their expectations were mistaken. But Jesus was resolved that nothing would prevent him from dying for his people's sins. The second phrase the people sang echoes the, the multitude of the heavenly host on the night that Jesus was born. While the heavenly host on that occasion sang of peace on earth, the earthly song, the earthly throng in Jerusalem on the first Palm Sunday sang of peace in heaven. As they did so, they probably didn't realize that peace on earth is dependent on peace in heaven. It's only when we have peace with God through faith in Jesus that we can have peace on earth. Just like not everyone celebrated King Charles's coronation, not everyone rejoiced at the arrival of Jesus in Jerusalem. Look at verses 39 and 40. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Jesus replied, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. These verses illustrate what we saw back in verse 14 of this chapter. The Pharisees hated Jesus, and they didn't want him to be their king. Notice that they called Jesus teacher rather than Lord or king. However, Jesus rebuked their attempt to suppress the joy of this occasion by pointing out that if his disciples stopped expressing their praise, the very stones would cry out in praise. All creation was made to worship Jesus, who is King and Lord of all. When we stop to think that Jesus deliberately entered Jerusalem, knowing that this would lead to his death as the atonement for our sins, we can't do anything but praise Jesus for who he is and what he did. while the whole crowd of Jesus' disciples rejoiced as he entered Jerusalem. Luke informs us in verses 41 and 42 that Jesus wept over Jerusalem and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. We also saw Jesus expressing concern for Jerusalem back in Luke chapter 13. Now with the panorama of Jerusalem before him, Jesus wept, not with quiet tears like those he shed at Lazarus's tomb, but with loud and deep wheels. Although the rejection of many of the Jews was predicted in the Old Testament, Jesus still felt great sorrow over their rejection. 
Jesus' sorrow reflects the heart of God as he contemplates the Jewish people rejecting his prophets and ultimately rejecting his son. The day that brings peace, which Jesus referred to, is the day when the true Messiah and King came. Jesus calls it the time of God's coming to you in verse 44. Peace, real peace, is the work of of God's salvation. Sadly, the majority of people in Jerusalem wouldn't experience this peace because in a few days they would reject Jesus since they could neither see nor understand what he had come to do. You see, if we have a wrong view of who Jesus is and what only Jesus can do for us, then we'll reject him as well, just like the crowd in Jerusalem eventually did because he doesn't fulfill our expectations. According to verses 43 and 44, Jesus went on to say, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Jesus used Old Testament language to describe the fall of Jerusalem, which would take place less than 40 years later in AD 70. The Romans fulfilled Jesus' words by constructing earthworks outside Jerusalem and besieging it before raising it to the ground. Jesus explained that this would happen to the inhabitants of Jerusalem as God's judgment on them for rejecting him. Jesus knew that the people of Jerusalem could have experienced peace under his rule. But he also knew how horrific God's judgment of their rejection of him would be. So it's no wonder that Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Jesus still weeps over those who reject what would bring them peace, which is turning away from their sin and repentance and turning to Jesus in faith. I wonder, is Jesus currently weeping over someone here or someone watching this service because you're rejecting what would bring you peace? The tears of Jesus are a measure of our value to him. In verses 45 and 46, we discover that sometime after Jesus' triumphal entry to Jerusalem, Probably the next day, he went to the temple courts to fulfill the words of Malachi, the last Old Testament prophet, who promised that the sovereign Lord would suddenly come to his temple. Jesus began driving out those who were selling. And he said to these people, it is written, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Instead of challenging the Roman rulers when he arrived in Jerusalem, Jesus targeted the misconduct of God's own people by pointing out their unfaithfulness to God. And this episode marks the beginning of Jesus' final confrontation with the Jewish religious leaders, which we'll see increasingly intensify now that Jesus has arrived in the center of their realm of power and influence. The temple courts that Luke mentions were probably the court of the Gentiles, where people sold animals for sacrifices. The court of the Gentiles was the only part of the temple where Gentiles could worship God. But during the Passover festival, traders set up their animal pens and their money tables there so that the Passover pilgrims could buy animals that met the ritual requirements for sacrifice and could change their money into the currency it was required to pay the temple tax. On top of preventing Gentiles from coming to worship God, sadly, these commercial ventures provided the opportunity for much greed and corruption. For these reasons, Jesus was righteously angry about the desecration of the Lord's house, 
So he sought to restore the temple to the function for which it was built by driving out those who were trading there. And this demonstrates Jesus' zeal for God's glory and the salvation of sinners. And we should be zealous for God's glory and the salvation of sinners too. When Jesus said, it is written, my house will be a house of prayer, he was quoting from Isaiah chapter 56, which assured godly Gentiles that they would be allowed to worship God in the temple. But by permitting the court of the Gentiles to become a noisy, smelly marketplace, the Jewish religious leaders were denying Gentiles this privilege and were failing to be a light to them. When Jesus said that the religious leaders had made the temple into a den of robbers, he was quoting from Jeremiah chapter 7. The temple had become a den of robbers, not only because of the financial exploitation that went on there, but because it was being robbed of its sanctity. And this warns us that as a church fellowship, we need to be careful that everything we do encourages the worship of God rather than hinders the worship of God. And as individuals, we need to make sure that we are worshiping God sincerely from our hearts and not just going through the outward rituals or relying on our association with our congregation. Jeremiah accused God's people of worshiping false gods and warned them that God would punish them by destroying the temple they trusted in. The temple of Jesus' time was destroyed by the Romans, along with the rest of Jerusalem in AD 70. The chapter ends with Luke informing us in verses 47 and 48 that every day Jesus was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. After cleansing the temple, Jesus taught there throughout the week leading up to his crucifixion. Jesus is everything. The ornate temple and the elaborate sacrifices that were offered there signified. He is the very presence of God. Jesus is the only access to God. Jesus is our atoning sacrifice, and Jesus is our mediator. Sadly, instead of listening to what Jesus was teaching and submitting to him so that they could be cleansed from their sins, the Jewish leaders chose to continually look for a way to kill Jesus who is both the Lord of the temple and the purifier of the temple. This is Luke's first explicit mention of a plot against Jesus' life. But what we read there in verse 47 is the beginning of the fulfillment of what Jesus repeatedly predicted since just before he set out on his journey to Jerusalem. The religious leaders' actions were motivated by the fear of Jesus' popularity fear of losing their social, economic, and political power, and a fear of public uprising. They correctly saw what Jesus did in the temple as a challenge to their authority and a challenge to their whole way of life. And Jesus still challenges our authority and our whole way of life. We want to be in charge of our own life rather than live under the rule of King Jesus. We want to receive people's praise rather than praise Jesus. So we need to ask God to enable us to stop living for ourselves and to start living for him. As we have studied Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem as a king, we have seen that he indeed is the one God sent. However, the religious leaders opposed him. And as a consequence of this, they would experience God's judgment. So this joyous occasion quickly became the basis of God's judgment on Jerusalem since the people of Jerusalem refused to receive their king. When we're trusting Jesus to be our Lord and Savior, then he is our king. 
So we need not fear appearing before him when he returns as judge. On that day, he will publicly declare us to be righteous because we are united to him through faith. But if you know that Jesus isn't your king, because you're not relying on him to rescue you from your sin and its consequences, then I'd encourage you to humbly seek God's forgiveness for your sins. Ask God to help you to live obediently under Jesus' lordship from now on. We are still in the time of God's favor and God's grace, but none of us knows how long that will last for any of us. And none of us knows when Jesus might return. Let's pray. Let's ask God to apply these lessons we have learned from his word to our heart as he sees our need. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus publicly pronounced that he is indeed the long-promised Messiah when he rode into Jerusalem on that colt. And Lord, we see his heart as he weeps over those he knew who would reject him. And Lord, we know that you see every heart here today. You see every heart that will listen to this service at some point in the future. Lord, if there are any who are rejecting Jesus as their king, we pray that you would come and you would show them the seriousness of their sin. Show them the uniqueness and the sufficiency of Jesus to save them from that sin. Enable them to repent of their sin and trust Jesus to be their saviour. For those of us that you have already saved by your grace, we pray you'd give us a concern for those who are currently rejecting Jesus. Help us to do all that we can to point them to Jesus by sharing the gospel with them, by living in obedience to you. Prevent us from doing anything that would ever hinder people from coming to Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Our closing praise is, Thou, Lord, hast given thyself for our healing. Pour out thy life that our souls might be free.
bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.